Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Ravi Gupta. I'm CEO and founder of Elias Techno Media. And I uh, welcome on the panelists uh, of uh, this session. And uh, uh, I think some of the uh, speakers are still joining. I can uh, see uh, Prabhakaranji now. Uh, Namaskar, Prabhakaranji. I can see Usha Ayerji uh, joining Usha ji. Hello. Hi, Namaste. And uh, I am uh, able to see uh, Mr. Hafejuddin Abad. Uh, welcome. And uh, Amit Kumar Jain. Uh, welcome, Amit ji. Namaskar. Namaskar for joining. And uh, Dr. D. Usha Reddy. Uh, I also welcome her. I think she, she is trying to join. Uh, so, by the time uh, Dr. Usha is joining and uh, let us uh, welcome uh, all our uh, speakers and uh, delegates. Uh, Namaskar Usha ji. Namaste. Namaste. So, uh, uh, Usha is out here. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. So, I had to... Uh, Hi Usha, how are you? Absolutely fine. Lovely seeing all of you. Yeah. Mm. Welcome. Uh, welcome all of you. And uh, so, uh, before we start the session, uh, may I uh, kindly request uh, each of the speakers to just uh, give a uh, one line or two line intro of, of yourself so that our audience is, uh, uh, knows about you. So uh, starting with Amit. Amit. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you know, I'm Amit Jain. I am a director for uh, the Oak Ridge International School in Vishakhapatnam. Uh, we are a part of uh, a chain of international schools across the world uh, called Nord Anglia Education. We have around 69 schools in 29 countries. And I look forward for a wonderful interaction with the co-panelists on the hot topic for the country, which is the new education policy. Thank you all. Welcome. Uh, Usha Ayerji, welcome. Yeah, hi. Uh, very warm welcome to everybody. And I think we've got a power-packed panel out here, panelists out here. And it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. And thank you, ELETS and GL to have invited me uh, to talk about this topic. And uh, I am the director of the Bangalore School and the Green School Bangalore. And uh, I'm also a director of the K-12 consultancy. So that's enough. We are basically teachers and educationists. That's it. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. And uh, we are honored to have you, Ushaji. Thanks for joining us. And uh, let me uh, welcome also uh, Meer uh, Abhijuddinji. Good morning, sir. Good morning, respected uh, principals, heads of schools. I'm Mir Afizuddin Ahmed. I head as a CEO of Nasser Group of Schools in Hyderabad. And also, I am the principal for the Nasser Boys School. Uh, it's great to be on the panel. Thank you so much for having me here. Welcome. Welcome. And uh, requesting uh, Dr. Usha Reddy to please introduce yourself. So very good morning to all of you. And uh, looking for, uh, forward to this discussion on uh, the much awaited new education policy that's now getting implemented uh, and the plans are on. So I am uh, the CEO of the Meridian Group of Schools and also the principal of Meridian School, Banjara Hills, a uh, national awardee from the President of India by CBSE. Welcome, Ushaji. Thank you. Thanks for joining. And uh, requesting our uh, guest from uh, UTI, uh, Mr. Uh, Prabhakar, to please introduce himself. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Prabhakaran, uh, heading uh, one of the oldest schools in the country, 162-year-old, uh, the Lawrence School, Loudale. And um, it's very good to be. It's, it's a privilege to be part of this esteemed panel. And um, a lot of international schools, new schools, traditional schools, and now the education in the pro process of, you know, moving on to the next stage, reinventing and, you know, uh, some sort of uh, changes are taking place. And I'm privileged to be a part of this discussion. And thank you for the ELITS team to give me an opportunity to express my views. Sure. And I think uh, uh, many of the uh, of, uh, panelists are coming on ELITS platform for the first time and uh, many are confused. What is ELITS? So let me uh, briefly explain. Uh, it uh, let's started 17 years uh, uh, back, and the uh, vision was let's go e, let's go electronic. So uh, at that time, the IT was uh, used less, and uh, we were uh, talking about electronic, elect uh, like the use of electronic uh, mediums for teaching, electronic uh, mediums for uh, efficiency. So uh, that's how this. Uh, 
world was formed e let's let's go electronic and i think which is let's go it so that was the aim that the time and uh, i think after 17 years uh, uh, due to the covid we are actually uh, uh, seeing the usage of uh, it in a big big way in schools uh, or, or or in higher education so let's uh, 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 i think the uh, discussion topic is nep and uh, the uh, morning uh, we had our keynote speaker uh, shri anil swaroop who is the former secretary of school education and who had a uh, uh, role to play in the initial stages of the nep and he elaborated about the various aspects about it and you all uh, would have uh, read and listened a lot of uh, debates on nep anyway so uh, asking uh, i'm going to ask in the beginning each of the speakers to speak to about uh, three to four minutes about your impressions about nep and uh, these are the initial remarks uh, which i'm uh, going to ask so let's be uh, brief and let's not repeat uh, what is already said and uh, try to add on the uh, uh, some points which you found interesting or not interesting in nep so uh, let me start with uh, dr usha reddy uh, please usha ji yeah thank you so i think uh, for me i think uh, one of the key um, points of the nep is formalizing the preschool education as we all know but what i would have liked to have seen there is uh, you know a little more detailing about specific teacher training for this sector of education now when it comes to middle school also they've come up with some wonderful ideas of you know 10 days of no bags and things like that which uh, i really appreciate because this gives uh, the children some time to get into some vocational experience and internship programs and uh, you know in the secondary level you know uh, removing the barriers you know between commerce and science and you know other streams and just letting them choose is something that was possible even earlier in a cbse school however it was not encouraged by the school so it wasn't a policy per se but i think schools and parents for the convenience of what the future trying to do that now i to uh, also say is that now the children have uh, you know more freedom to do and probably the awareness is there and uh, you know even if we encourage them unless it gets implemented at the higher education level very quickly though the the nep does speak of higher education with a mixed bag of making it uh, you know multidisciplinary at university level unless that gets implemented then these children taking these gamut of subjects uh, you know will be in a confused state so i think when we're drawing timelines for implementation of nep i look at you know the progression as something that is uh, very very important i'm also elated by the four year b ed program and things like that which i think will give us standard and quality teaching in the future we must understand that in many countries the brightest of brains actually only can become teachers and here mostly in india and it's very sad to say many people don't get into this profession by choice but it is more by chance you know and then of course many of them are doing a good job but i do hope you know with the incentives and scholarships that the government is given for very bright brains to take a four year integrated b ed course will motivate uh, you know some of the smartest brains to get in and of course the remuneration must be enhanced and implemented strictly and that will motivate children also to feel that yes this is uh, you know a noble profession and uh, it's as good as being in other uh, professions so let, why not consider this and i think that quality of education will impact the economy of the country and the overall learning that happens in all our schools so in a nutshell these are few of my uh, observations okay. uh on great input sir dr usha ji and you have highlighted the important points here uh, let me uh, reach out to amit kumar jain and uh, requesting him to give your observations on this thank you ravi ji i think uh, apart from the points that usha dr usha has mentioned here uh, for me one most important thing uh, which i think in the morning uh, shri uh, anil ji has also echoed is about putting the money in the uh, in the right places so i uh, you know we know that today india is probably you know ranked among the uh, way way lower in terms of the 
uh, percentage of GDP spend we have on education. And I'm very glad to see that NEP actually starts, uh, you know, with the vision that we will have 6% of the GDP spent on education. While I know this has been the dream for a long time, but I wish that this government actually puts the money in the right place. Uh, uh, actually, I was astonished to also see that uh, the the percentage GDP that we spend on education is actually lower than Ghana and Tanzania. So uh, we need to actually perk up that. That's one important thing that I really want to emphasize on the new education policy. Uh, you know, related to that is also the point that uh, the amount of money we spend on uh, per child in terms of education. Uh, just to give some stats, uh, US spends 100 times uh, you know, more per student than what India spends today on per child on elementary and primary education. Uh, you know, our neighbor China spends 10 times what we spend on per child. So I think uh, as Anilji also mentioned in the morning, it all boils down to the money. And if the new education policy is able to bring in that money in the right places, which it has envisaged in the policy, I think the implementation definitely would be the key to take uh, India really to the next, uh, you know, to really being acknowledged superpower as the policy and Thank you. Great points, Amit. Uh, thanks for highlighting this. Uh, let me request uh, Mr. Mira Ahmed to uh, give your observation to the policy. Thank you, Ravi, sir. So the biggest, I think, uh, the plus point on the NEP, what I saw was, uh, that it finally brings education onto one single platform wherein uh, all our boards like CBSE, ICSE, IGCSE or the state syllabuses, now they would be teaching at a single uh, level okay. rather than, you know, uh, parents uh, choosing and running between schools and boards and curriculums wherein, you know, different curriculums would teach in different platforms or different strides of uh, education. And uh, finally, uh, I think India, you know, came up to a standard and level wherein the government steps in and says that this is the basic, that minimum that you need to teach uh, in a school and which will bring all the students from all walks of life into a single uh, you know, uplifted platform. The second uh, plus point, uh, what I find over here is that uh, uh, no longer parents uh, would be running behind uh, things like uh, uh, subjects like only maths and science, wherein you know, children are also encouraged to take up uh, uh, arts and, you know, alternate courses, right? Alternate courses, what we, you know, say now uh, would be mainstream courses uh, for the future. Uh, we needed uh, professional uh, 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 individuals for uh, in India in the future to take up arts, uh, to, to take up, you know, uh, psychology or to take up, you know, various uh, fields that, you know, as Indians, as people, we or uh, you normally used to neglect. So I think NEP, you know, catapults us into a more uh, stronger future, wherein our students of today can be a better citizen of tomorrow. You know, you know, getting up as able and uh, you know, uh, more uh, uh, productive part of the society. So that is what I feel NEP is all about right now. Uh, great inputs, uh, Meera Maji. Thanks for that. And let me uh, reach out to Usha. I, uh, yes, Usha Ayerji. Yeah. Hi, all of you. I think I heard Dr. Usha Reddy speak about it as well as uh, uh, Mr. Ahmed speak about this as well as Mr. Amit Jain. I think very valid points of whatever your viewpoints are. My uh, uh, the way I look at it, when Kasturi Ranganji had presented the NEP in, and uh, it was like a draft. And later on, it became like a dream come true uh, policy. And every one of us uh, were very happy to see it during the pandemic time it has come, where we are actually juggling with economy and health. We are not actually looking at education at all. And that's the time when it has come. And uh, what is a good point about is already the private schools are already practicing it, like the Green School Bangalore is already practicing. Resilience is one of our core points. And uh, so it's not a big deal for us, but it's a big deal for the government schools. So that's where I'm happy about it, that it's going to take the gamut of all the schools together with the state board, ICC, CPC, IGCC, and it's going to be in par with the international schools. So it's like no child left behind policy, which is excellent. They're trying to bring in all the dropouts to crore of children who are not in the mainstream or not in education. They want to bring them about. They have not even thought about what challenges we're going to face. They're just thinking about how, just to bring everybody together and give them education which is a very good point. Then second thing, which I find like uh, the teacher training part of it, because the teachers are actually the first crux of the entire thing is teachers need to be trained. 
they think about a lot of stuff they think about um, uh, you know uh, giving them uh, ipads giving them computers uh, talking about digital literacy and i'm also happy the 2030 education goals uh, which uh, actually uh, atmanirbhar plan which modi ji was talking in 2018 19 before the covid itself that has come in nep it, it, uh, you know and we talking about that global sustainability model which has come in equity but all this is fine but we are not talking about uh, andragogy that is teacher training and i'm happy that that government is going to spend money in training teachers and also giving digital equipments to those children those millions of children we're talking about say 2.4 million children already there in the government schools talking about that and i'm also happy the gdp is going to increase like as uh, mr amit jain was talking about 2.5 it's being spent and they're going to talk about 6% of gdp which is going to be spent how where when how and how how they're going to do it it's the biggest question mark with the government is going to think about and those are the challenges i think next session and probably more uh, webinars coming together are going to be discussing how the implementation is going to be done yes it's not going to be overnight it's not going to be the next day we have got about 10 years down the line but the 10 years down the line it's also biggest challenge because every year in a phased manner we have to accomplish this so these are the two things which i will be pointing out i think as it goes ahead i'll be talking about more things thank you so much to have taken sure. my yeah great input susha ji uh, thanks for that uh, some of the things which, which private schools are anyway implementing and uh, they are being incorporated in the policy itself and so i think that point and uh, let me uh, uh, Request from Mr. Prabhakar to give your impressions on the policy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it was really pleasure to hear from all of you. Uh, what I feel is we are slowly moving from our traditional teaching style, learning style, from chalk and talk to experiential learning. All right, this educational policy is giving lot of opportunities, lot of avenues to introduce different pedagogical techniques. If you actually look at it, it's not all that easy to make a framework. to a country like india with the multiplicity of uh, you know issues uh, linguistic diversity cultural diversity geographical diversity you know many countries let it be us or european countries they have a very homogeneous type of uh, system ours is not like that ours is more like a, a subcontinent rather indian subcontinent we can say so looking at all these aspects the policy this education policy has come out with some very very positive points number one is you know they have inculcated that uh, multiple uh, linguistic ability where focus on uh, culture focus on uh, mother tongue focus on understanding our culture and tradition and indian way of of looking things which is very important as far as the values are concerned because education is not just degrees and diplomas it's not marks and grades it's it's a it's a process of a lifelong discovery of uh, ourselves so they're looking into that second most important aspect it has addressed is dropouts if you actually look at the dropouts from first standard to uh, 10th and 10th to plus 2 and plus 2 to degree it is very very uh, saddening to see in a large number of kids who join on the lower stream they don't reach the top stream so here the multiple entry entry and exit system will give some sort of support that even if somebody is unable to do certain course in first year in degree or second year in degree he can go take a one year out and come back this is this will give an opportunity for a lot of people who are struggling and suffering with time frame situation and the third important thing which i would like to say is um, uh, look everything uh, very often uh, goes in a stereotype system uh, oh you are good in studies mathematics physics chemistry is your they are your so slightly better commerce accounts accountancy and someone who's not very much good into all these things yes you will go for history geography like that you know the stereotype system is going to break that's something which i really like about it you can take any subject you want at the end of it it's not the subject it is how you convert it so in that way the stereotype traditional system is going to be broken so that will give ease to a lot of uh, uh, people and you know there are a lot of um, indirect classification of people's intellectual level linked with the subject which they are, they are learning and teaching is very often there we all know in our classrooms in our schools that will slowly fade away but to a large extent there is one aspect of it who are going to implement it we teachers we educators how efficient we are how holistic we are are we moving out from a competitive spirit a competitive setup to a collaborative setup are we going to take it uh, to the best of our ability 
So that is what we have to wait and see. It may be five years, it may be 10 years, it may be 15 years, irrespective of whatever time frame they are putting in. It is the commitment and it is a contribution of people like us, the teachers. You don't need BAD, MED, PhD and international degrees. Kindness, compassion, collaborative skills. These are the basic aspects in which we have to take care of this holistic approach. And I'm waiting to see how the teachers are going to come out. See, most of us are in our comfort zone, being honest with you. How are we going to move out of our comfort zone and take this challenge and put it at the best of our ability? That is what we have to see in the years to come. As a policy, as a system, it's a very holistic idea. We always talk about education for life or education for living. It is education for life. So let's see how committed we are. And our commitment matters a lot on uh, fruitful implementation of this policy. Thank you. Great uh, points uh, from Akranji. And I think you have uh, taken some uh, part of the point which I'm uh, going to ask in the uh, second uh, round of these questions. And that point is more uh, on the ground issues. My question is that uh, I think someone uh, mentioned about this uh, policy which impact the government schools, but also there are components of the policy which will impact the private schools. So, and uh, we have uh, heard a, a lot of debates and speeches from the uh, various I think, people on NDP and uh, as in the morning, Sarojji uh, uh, mentioned that uh, uh, going from 3% of spending to 6% of spending is looks good on the paper, but it's not likely to happen. Uh, central government does not have money, state government does not have the money. Uh, you would have read the papers that states are uh, demanding their GST use. It's not happening. Like the central government is like saying we have uh, the money. So any increase in this government spending is like unlikely to happen in the short term, in two years, three years, four years. But uh, what may happen more is uh, uh, more of the non-financial things, uh, which may get implemented faster. So uh, what are uh, your views on the, the impact NEP if it gets implemented happens on the private schools? All the uh, people who do the panel right now are sitting on the back that are in the uh, private school segment. So I'm uh, uh, requesting each of you to comment on, uh, think about your school, your uh, children and your uh, parental ecosystem and how you are in the school. And what are the possible positives or negatives which may happen if or, or, or uh, like, uh, like asking you differently, what are the opportunities and challenges of implementing NEP in a private school? So let me request uh, Amit uh, Kumar Jain to respond first. Thank you, Raviji. Uh, so if you ask, uh, as somebody has, uh, I think, uh, Usha here has mentioned that uh, it is not a challenge for private schools today in India to really implement the NEP. Uh, and if you ask from a perspective of uh, Oak Ridge International Schools, uh, I would rather say that there will be a zero impact of the NEP on the way we run education today at Oak Ridge. A reason is uh, uh, the, the vision the policy has set in uh, has actually, we have been implementing that for the last two decades now. So whether it is in terms of, uh, uh, see the most important thing uh, as Prabhakaranji has also mentioned is, you know, the whole education policy has uh, been drafted as being a child centric policy. You know, uh, not looking at just marks and the progression of the children, but in terms of what does the child want to learn. And, uh, you know, I would like to actually recall uh, Sir Ken Robinson, uh, whom we have recently lost so sadly, who spoke about the purpose of education. Uh, see, if you really understand uh, the purpose of education uh, is for holistic development of the child. It is about them to understand uh, the learn the environment around them. And if that is the case, uh, uh, the traditional way of judging the students uh, based on the report cards and marks uh, is absolutely useless. And so I'm very glad that the policy envisages this uh, as a vision. And uh, the, the effects of this policy on uh, uh, private school per se, I do not see anything much. Uh, however, one very interesting thing that I see here is pairing of schools. 
where the government has the policy has actually written down that if they can pay the the private and the uh, public schools around in an area and they talk about efficient utilization of resources i think that will be a wonderful thing and as a school for example uh, uh, you know we have actually been partnering with all the uh, government schools in our area and the results are beautiful whether it is in terms of digital literacy to the students who are who do not have access to digital resources or whether it is with respect to creating compassion in our students uh, uh, so i think that particular aspect is something which i really look forward uh, and uh, see how this pairing can actually improve our public uh, education system uh great reports uh, abit uh may request uh uh meet uh, amit uh, ji to respond on uh, impact of any of the private schools i think there are a components about uh, vocational uh, like vocationalization of education into reducing uh, vocational education from six itself and there are uh, many other uh, points so how do you see that that uh, rolling out actually thank you sir Yeah. Sir, as uh, Prabhakaran sir has rightly pointed out in his uh, statement, that uh, you know, as of now, all of us, uh, most uh, private schools, are in a competitive mode. You know, all of us see that how we are going to uh, e school is going to do better than the other one. So the NEP uh, basically is going to put all of us into one uh, equal plane, and, and wherein. and the standardization of education is going to be placed into place now with this implementation things like you know uh, age groups per class is going to be in effect for example the nep has given the minimum age for uh, admission into nursery minimum age for admission as one things like that wherein the competitive spirit among schools on how the children are admitted into schools and all that will be eliminated and a uh, Equal in a proper guideline for schools and also for the parents being pointed out over here. Looking at the same, wherein pri most private schools, like Mr. Amit and Usha Ma'am also has rightly said, that most private schools are already doing this and they are they are for them to be better than the other schools. They have already implemented most of the policies that have been pointed out in the NEP. So it's not a big challenge for private schools to take this up. now what differs now in the nep is that all of us will be put into one uh, st standardized uh, systematic operational procedure wherein if a uh, curriculum is taught in class 3 then all schools will be taught the same curriculum or the offering of the same uh, concepts will be there in all the schools so i think that is one plus point for uh, students and parents wherein no longer they need to juggle between schools saying that this school is teaching this so i will put my child over there and then again they find that they you know this uh, they would like to go to another school again so this juggling system will stop in private schools wherein you know where in older days where in a child when a child is admitted into the lowest class for example nursery child passes out from school in class 12 but unfortunately in the recent years it has become a very uncertain wherein schools themselves are not sure i think everyone will agree with me over here where schools themselves are not sure that if a particular child joins in class 1 if the child is going to be passing out of the same school in 12th or no because while the journey continues parents suddenly find a school which is doing something a bit better or they have a new different system of education or they have a, a nicer smart class or they have a theater or something like that and you know they they would shift their schools so i think that question will be removed with the introduction of nep it reports uh, meera ma ji uh, uh, you have highlighted uh, that standard standardization will uh, help in uh, like uh, reducing the anomalies in uh, school education okay Uh, let's hear, uh, hear uh, from dr usha reddy uh, your uh, views on this subject yeah. so just uh, taking off from where uh, mr hafiz uddin uh, rightly put it i would like to make a, a little uh, difference in my comments here see when it comes to the implementation of the nep and what it talks about of um, you know is different from what the national curriculum framework is all about now we all do follow what is known as the national national curriculum framework which defines what ought to be learned by a child at a particular age or class so when they enter and when they leave the class what are the minimum levels of learning and you know what is it that we need to do so that's already there 
However, even the NCF after the NEP is going to get now uh, upgraded uh, and uh, standardized once again. So, you know, I feel that the difference perhaps is in the way the same curriculum is handled differently by different schools. So that amount of creativity, freedom, and developing of these 21st century skills, uh, you know, and keeping the child happy because he's enjoying the learning is what actually is the difference between most private schools. He's very right in saying that all of us are doing, you know, um, you know, the same thing. It's just that we're doing it differently. And then when something is more successful than the others, then obviously there is that comparison. So the basis of content is the same in the class for all of us. The way the pedagogy is handled is what is different. And probably the intangibles of every organization in how you actually treat and respect the two, uh, student's voice and how you actually accommodate uh, parents and you know, bring about awareness is uh, a vast difference that you, it cannot be scripted, but it's an intangible uh, culture of each organization. It's very rightly put by the speakers before me that most of the things are being done in uh, private uh, top-end schools, but private schools doesn't mean schools like ours alone. You have budget private schools, which are probably still doing growth, still you know doing the traditional method. They do not have the infrastructure. They are private schools as well. So you know when we look at this uh, range of economic uh, diversity in our country, you know that is the challenge in how this particular NEP is going to get uh, implemented because we all understand that it is uh, between the center and the state being a concurrent subject. Now each state again will uh, start debating on simple things like multilingualism that has to be there in the initial years. Now, what I feel is that, you know, there are many things in the NEP that can be done. For example, you know, the 10 bagless days can easily be implemented. Projects on, um, you know, our uh, languages has to be done, which they've suggested that can easily be done. And, you know, offering vocational subjects as well you know, and giving them the liberty to choose whether it is something to do with sport or music or drama or, uh, you know, something else along with other subjects that, you know, will start getting implemented shortly. And we must encourage that as well. But my only concern is that what is the next step after taking these subjects? Are the colleges going to accept them? Now, when it comes to the GDP and hopefully, you know, that happens, I do feel that there are lots of things, uh, you know, where money is required and that's for large scale implementation and sustainability. Now that the governments, both at the center and the state must come onto one page and see what is what can be done. I do believe that digitalization can actually equalize education. So investing in digital infrastructure, you know, by every state, can actually, you know, kind of enhance the quality of education. I will give you an example because we've adopted 15 government schools and for two decades I've been striving, not just with these premium Meridian schools that I deal with, but 15 government schools with hardly any infrastructure. But, you know, I think this whole idea of pairing up of, uh, you know, or partnering with these schools is an amazing idea, like which uh, even the gentleman from Oak Ridge Group was mentioning. Many of us are doing it, but this is going to get formalized. So I think we will have a lot of them taking up. And when you have a digital setup, then it becomes easy to use your best faculty to also kind of uh, give them quality uh, teaching. We can go to offline teaching as well and, uh, you know, use podcasts or something else, which we're using for our children any which ways. And we're probably going to share that with them. So though the government has also come up with, uh, you know, the Diksha and Swayam and a lot of other, uh, you know, kind of platforms which will have digital content, setting up the basic thing right now, the debate is why haven't online classes started for these schools? Simple, because they don't even possess a smartphone. So you may have the content, but how are they going to teach us going to deliver that? So, you know, I'm waiting and watching to see. In fact, uh, I'd like to share that we've started this initiative of let's collect all the smartphones that we have in our own group of schools, you know, from the parents. And the first thing is to get them all in working condition and donate them to these children so that at least, you know, they will get a SIM and, uh, you know, with a network connection, they can start their online classes. So, you know, we need not wait for the government to do everything. I believe that it is our duty to make a beginning. And this is the small beginning that I have suggested with many of my colleagues and we're taking it up head on, you know, at uh, Hyderabad. I am sure that each one of you, if you cross your hearts, would have changed a phone, it's lying in some drawer, you know, which you may not use, but just think of it by donating that one child is going to get educated. It's something you don't need. 
you know, which is just, uh, you know, abandoned somewhere in the corner of your house. So I believe these kind of things to help the education in our country is something that we have to think creatively, innovatively, and, you know, kind of drive that. When it comes to our school, I, like was rightly said, whether it is, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, coding, all of this is already being done. And we are talking of 21st century skills. Schools like ours are already doing it. It is our role and responsibility now to share and make sure that it's not just the government, but we're going to implement it, at least select one partner school and do it there. You know, so that's just, uh, you know, my take on this. Thank you. Great uh, thoughts, uh, Ushaji. And I think uh, you're uh, uh, mentioning about this pairing of schools, which Amit also mentioned that uh, this uh, policy at least uh, makes a steps to recog uh, like recognize and formalize that. The uh, role of uh, private sector in school education has been neglected and ignored by the governments uh, till now. And I think uh, this, at least this recognition uh, gives a uh, more uh, formality to this arrangement. And also like it, it is a win-win situation for uh, both the private schools and the government schools. Thanks for highlighting uh, that uh, point. And of course, that uh, point about uh, uh, donating your old mobile. That's a great thought indeed. Thanks for that. And let me uh, uh, request uh, Prabhakaran Ji to uh, give your uh, views about impact of this NEP on private school education in India. Um, uh, I have. I have uh, heard a lot of uh, points which are mentioned by my um, fellow teachers, but I look at this as a big challenge because in paper, it looks very simple. It's not. First of all, there need to be a massive mindset change. You walk into a classroom and how your teachers are teaching now is, has to change. Now it is basically chalk and talk or some digital device or some PPT or some, it's not going to be like that. It is like learning by doing not for one day, not for two days, for one entire curriculum, one entire term, or maybe one entire academic year. How are our teachers going to adapt according to that? We have to plan and work out converting them from that traditional style of teaching to an experiential level of teaching. The pedagogical method needs to be changed. Second, um, I'm not touching the points which my fellow colleagues have already mentioned it. This is an opportunity for us to inculcate certain level of dignity of labor. For example, 10 bagless days. Let's take our children to a farm, take them to a workplace, make them understand it is not the doctor, engineer, and uh, you know the software engineer which, who makes the world. There are people on the lower strata who work hard. And they're not, they're not taken, you know, they're ignored very often because they do not have that social status. So here, these things can be utilized as an open can be used as an opportunity to show our children what real India is. It's a big challenge. Our teachers have to come out of their comfort zone, number one, and we have to train our teachers what exactly this, this particular, um, you know, system, what is the mission of this, this, this particular system that we have to communicate to them. And then another important thing is we all compete. Competition is the spirit of all of our existence all these days. Every school, if you look at their website, only very few schools don't put their you know, percentage of marks and uh, uh, glowing testimonies. Most of the school put it because we are competing. There is a fairly good level of marketing going on from our side. I'm being honest with you. Now it has to come to an end. Progress and growth is not just progress of a handful of institutions. Progress and growth of the entire community, entire country. So we have to move from that competitive mindset to a collaborative mindset. And a lot of things are there hidden in this, a lot of, lot of things which is not very clear at the moment. But I, I look at this, even though most of us are doing this on, an experience, on a day-to-day -day basis, but putting it on a platform over a period of one whole year, moving into one generation to another generation, we need to change the mindset of teachers. A lot of infrastructural, a lot of you know, cultural shift has to be done. And uh, it is a big challenge. And uh, looking at our country, looking at the length and breadth of our country, um, there are places in India, um, people doesn't even have access to pure drinking water. We are talking about iPhone and multiple technology. But is the private school only will be able to do it? If we are the only one who is doing it, is it going to be a uniform growth as 
envisaged by these education policies. So there are a lot of brainstorming has to be done from top level and we teachers have to be open to new ideas and suggestions and we have to be prepared for an entire revamping of our mindset towards uh, you know, putting this on a grassroots level. And finally, it will be a good, a good system to start with. Thank you. Great inputs, uh, Prabhakaranji. I think you highlighted the various, uh, both the opportunities and also the challenges of implementing NAP in a private school. And uh, requesting Usha Ayer to kindly uh, give your views. Yeah, hi. Um, I'd like to take up Hitesh Marotra's question first before even I give my inputs. Question is, is NEP going to be implemented in one go or will it be implemented phase-wise to see how it can be improvised and perfected for fitting in all schools and boards? I think it's going to be phase-wise, Mr. Hitesh Malhotra, because it cannot be done overnight, as I told beforehand. And uh, you also said how it can be improvised and perfected for fitting in all schools. Yes, it's going to be the biggest challenge because as everybody put in that Dr. Usha Reddy put in and Mr. Ahmed, Mr. Anil Kumar and everybody said in their schools, they have been doing all this. And even in our schools, we've been doing all that. So it has to be done in all the schools. And somebody has infrastructure problem. Somebody has fund issues. Somebody has teachers who don't have the mindset. So you have so many different problems. So it has to be sorted out at that level and then implemented Mr. Hitesh Malhotra. Now coming to the point what you asked me, Mr. Gupta. So let me uh, give you my inputs. Uh, there are three things which I like to talk about and that is interdisciplinary uh, subjects, you know, the way we are handling in our schools, especially the Green School Bangalore. And uh, what we do is like, uh, we do an integrated curriculum and integrated way of uh, teaching. And uh, we also try to rope in other schools. We have cluster school programs, wherein we have some government schools which are very nearby. So teach one, each one program we do. And we try to change the mindset of the teachers. I always insist on andragogy. I don't insist on pedagogy because I'm basically a teacher trainer. So I feel the teachers need to be trained first and bring in the quality later because the quality comes in with the teachers. If teachers' mindset changes and there's no fund involved in that, if the mindset and attitude has to change. So if our teachers are good, why don't we send our teachers to those government schools to teach so that we have the community outreach programs and try to change a little bit, maybe a one person or two person we can take. We cannot keep waiting government to come in the picture and saying government will train, there'll be changes happening, but changes has to happen at our end. That's what I feel. When we all are doing this, then why don't we take the unaided private schools along with us? Why don't we say, take these government schools where these teachers are do doing this? We are doing that anyways in a very smaller manner. But if they give us a chance, we might even take 10 under our phones. So that is the way to go ahead as far as this uh, teacher training is concerned and the mindset to be changed is concerned. As far as the interdisciplinary subjects are concerned, the way the subjects have to be handled, I think no more it can be a standalone subject. It's okay. We are all doing the same thing in our schools. We are talking about the internationalism. We're talking about standardization. We're talking about Samagri Shiksha. Samagri Shiksha to come across and all the curriculum to be standardized, it's going to take immense lot of time in India. It's not going to happen. CBSE will say our curriculum is good. ICC is going to say our curriculum is good. And IGC is saying, oh, we are the best because we do so many things. Digital literacy has come in a time of COVID. Otherwise, do you think CBSE and ICC will change? CBSE, ICC love to uh, teach through blackboards. And they say that we are very modern, we are doing this, we're doing that. We are ultimately using green boards and blackboards. We haven't changed. We changed because it was trust upon us. It came in the COVID time. So now let's stick on to it. That's very important. I'm not talking about my school alone. I'm talking about every single school in India. Let's stick on to this digital literacy. Let it be more of blended learning. Because if it's going to be back again, there's nothing going to be normal. It's going to be new normal. We're going to do new normal namaste. We're going to have social distancing. We're going to have all that stuff. So why don't we have this blended learning go ahead? And so that 2030 education goals talks about digital literacy and health literacy. Health literacy is already coming. We keep Googling what is good for us health-wise. Why don't we also look at digital literacy as the way to go ahead? So that's, again, the second thing. And third thing is we're talking about learning outcomes and not learning objectives anymore, which is excellent NAP. We are doing that in our schools. But why don't we do that in other schools instead of saying, portions khatam karo, curriculum khatam karo, and we have to do so much, so much. Why don't we change the mindset of another stakeholder, and that is parents? 
it's very very important see we are pressurized by the parents and we finish our portions and curriculum and that's where again it's going to go back into the same stream and saying whether we are using digital technology we are using uh, you know face to face whatever interface we are going to go back into finishing our portions 10 standard there will be pressure on children there will be board exams why can't these stakeholders now the drafters come back to us they are asking our inputs tell them to scrap off this kind of examination system at 10th and 12th you, they have got lot of good points doing internship is good you know leaving one year after 12th and starting looking at a career option you know after 12th and saying what is good for you and everything is very very good but again the 10th and 12th board is still existing if 10th and 12th board is existing all our teachers are going to finish the portions and you know it gets diluted we all know how we do in icsc we do the 10th standard portion in 8th standard and 7th standard which is very unfortunate so do you think there'll be change happening so change the mindset of parents change the mindset at the educational boards change the mindset of the teachers and then the whole change and the whole gamut will change and i think the grading system has to totally change and if all these changes will be brought about i think that there'll be biggest change which will happen i know we are all doing all the modern methods in our school but don't you think all your report cards talks about a plus a b plus b and 90% and 100% don't you think our parents are still talking about 90% my mera bachcha to 95% laya hai so this is what they're talking about right to change that mindset if that mindset is going to be changing then all this nep and all this new methodology all this new andragogy everything will fall in place so don't you think mr gupta what i'm talking makes a lot of sense so this is what it's good to say that our school is good our school is the best and we are doing the best but we will take the entire gamut along with us and the stakeholders with us and so let's all give the inputs uh, for the you know uh, whatever they have given as a draft i think we all have to give inputs and let's take parents along with us to give inputs so we'll get the exact you know 360 degree evaluation of the nep that's what i think the points uh, usha ji i think you have touched a range of issues uh, including the teacher uh, training issues and of course the uh, expectations of the parents i think the, uh, the uh, one of the biggest hurdles of uh, implementing nep is parents perhaps uh, because uh, they are like totally in a different uh, mindset and uh, so uh, we are at the concluding round of the session and uh, i am requesting each of the panelists to ask about Like asking you about the uh, Usha ji uh, mentioned uh, just uh, mentioned about uh, COVID situation. Like because of uh, COVID, CBSE changed. Like unless uh, it had happened, like uh, changing CBSE norms and like these uh, things is unimaginable. So, what are the opportunities? I think uh, both. I, I think after April, uh, India has like Indian school education sector has been. Uh, Uh, discussing uh, first about uh, covid-19 and now about nep so i am uh, combining both the things and asking each, each of the panelists that what combining the covid-19 and nep what are the opportunities these the two milestone uh, points in the like school education uh, sector of this country uh, provide like uh, in the next one year or two year uh, uh, scenario so what opportunities of like radical changes in uh, school uh, education system we can expect we can uh, foresee so requesting uh, to start with uh, meera ahmed ji to respond first sorry sir thank you so much very interesting uh, question indeed i truly think that uh, uh, and i agree to usha ji ma'am that uh, through the reason all of us came onto the digital platform was because of the covid situation both icsc and cbsc schools they have all uh, opted for this and uh, the most important thing what ravi sir uh, just uh, in the question what you asked was what is the impact on education for school education uh, through the scenarios can be uh, resulted and uh, what usha ma'am and also prabhakar sir said in the, the earlier talks was that you know educational uniformity throughout uh, uh, social status can be formed and formulated through this uh, digital learning medias wherein we can share uh, uh, academics through various social media and through private media platforms to children who were not even getting the basic academic structures till date now the uh, just to uh, put this in front there are many individuals and organizations who have come forward in the covid situation where they are either installing community 
uh, uh, computers or they are installing, com uh, they are distributing uh, Samsung tabs and things like that through villages around so that these children also can be educated and they can have their academics going on even when the schools have not been running. And through uh, already mediums that are available that like YouTube and Vimeo, uh, their educators on freelance as a social service, they have been uploading their own uh, uh, curriculum media. For example, they're, they're teaching mathematics on YouTube and you can just go onto the YouTube link and there are hundreds and thousands of children who are following this uh, YouTube video and they're learning mathematics. So what has resulted in a, a positive result in this is wherein students were uh, bogged down to only one a source of information where academics was concerned. Now through the COVID time, they have multiple sources of uh, gathering their academic information. That is, I think, a very positive thing that has come in into uh, where a child's learning is into uh, the picture in the COVID times. Great inputs, uh, Mirza, and uh, requesting uh, Dr. Usha Reddy to respond on this, please, about the opportunities. Uh, you know, I feel that the entire way in which the entire world is learning has changed because of the pandemic. And we have never seen the use of, uh, you know, uh, digitalization to the extent that we are doing now. And the skills have definitely got upgraded for all of us. And yes, for the little ones, I understand it's a stress for the parents to be along with the children and accompany them while the classes are on and all of that. But we do have a synchronous and asynchronous classes also to make sure that uh, there is enough of on-screen and off-screen time. I mean, I was just reviewing the entire activities of the whole school, uh, you know, after the first term. And I realized that there was nothing that was not done which was done when we were in school. Other than the personal interaction, that eye-to-eye -eye contact, of course, which is also virtual now, and children missing schools, uh, and to be, uh, you know, listening to the laughter of them on the campus. But I think all activities, whether it's exploration or experiential learning, all of them was done. And I think my confidence that our kids are self-learners has really, you know, gone up so much because I feel that we follow the 5E strategy where uh, in the five stages, Alternative stages are, you know, off screen and children have to explore and elaborate on what's being done. So I think that has been, uh, you know, a big learning for me. And I've realized that why didn't we do this earlier? So for all the tech, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, if you want some advice, this is the time for y'all to make it big. So see how, you know, you can set up infrastructure in these schools that lack this infrastructure, digital infrastructure, and make it a wide use platform where a lot of free and open source material can uh, be then delivered to them. Government has done. The schools that are partnering can also, you know, kind of use those platforms. I'm just hoping that we come up with uh, more platforms like, you know, Zoom and um, MS Teams and all that by our own uh, country. So that, you know, it becomes vastly used and there is, you know, it also boosts the economy of our own country. So, you know, I feel that, uh, you know, why are we, you know, not looking at taking this even after the pandemic? For example, you want to have a meeting like this, you know, we would have all had to fly down to one particular city and we would have done it. But don't you think the learning is almost the same? Don't you think the way we are expressing our ideas or the takeaways for the participants, if they're paying attention and they're really serious, is going to be the same and the costs really come down. So this is an age for digital learning and sharing. And, uh, you know, I find huge opportunities in this. In fact, for even the preschoolers, I mean, we had this idea of coming up with a lot of stuff with apps and contents and stuff like that, because I think this is the need of the hour. And everybody need not, you know, reinvent the wheel but create a platform that, you know, most stuff which is there can be placed on that platform and it will be vastly used. So the number of people who use it will become very, very broad based. So, you know, I'm a positive person and I do believe that this pandemic has thrown open a lot of creative ideas related to education. And I'm so excited, uh, you know, talking to a lot of uh, techpreneurs and, you know, entrepreneurs. And, you know, I think this whole thing has opened up the way we think of how education should be. And, you know, the NEP also specifies, uh, you know, special training for gifted children and with special needs and all that. One thing I would have appreciated if they had put in 
is that you know picking up credit system so for a very bright kid also you know if they are good in math they can go two levels up three levels up and once you're done with it you know you kind of speed up with your other subjects and actually conclude your education today being in a brick and mortar institution has its limitations as i look at it it's more for social some connectivity issue here uh let's uh, uh, uh move ahead and uh, uh, let me request uh, mr prabhakar that i am asking you that what is uh, like what you uh, wished was added in the nep what they missed out see what Uh, see, see, in 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 any way, there are a lot of things need to be clarified. For example, even now we are giving feedback. All the heads are asked to give feedback. Uh, number one is the time frame. You know, how are they going to do the transition? We are not very sure about how the transition is going to take place. And um, the second thing is that there are a lot of center straight conflicts are going on at the moment with reference to certain languages. For example. Oh, how, why are you implementing this language? Why do you have to teach them? Center state that need to be addressed because our country is, as I mentioned it, it is not a, a homogeneous group of people. We yeah. we are coming from. We moved on in the history. We look at it from um, Indus Valley to Vedic to you know Mughals to British to you know post independence, and now we are in a, a globalized era. You know all these changes have made a lot of. Uh, Uh, you know cultural add up into various system and we need to look into very very sensitive way what we say in the book about language what we talk about on a pedagogical method is entirely different from what common man on the street going to understand so we have to absorb that that how how are we going to do it that is something which need to be addressed and other thing is that when you are opening up everything you can have a choice of your subject then you can have a choice of your language and also the medium of instruction also should be given a choice one should not focus no this should be the medium of instruction in this class that should be up to this if it can be a bit more flexible again the policy is still under lot of uh, discussions and all this so that is one thing otherwise it is a great idea and i would like to answer one question which you have not asked me but i am very tempted to give you the no, answer sure. after after sure. listening to our esteemed uh, uh, panel members you know what has covid taught us it has taught us some beautiful things you know it is like you know um, all these gadgets you are talking about microsoft these are all there we never used it now this gives us a feel that you know we people the amazing ability of human beings to adapt evolve and go ahead with their work we let it be teaching let it be life let it be anything life is worth living so this is what it has taught us isn't it it is not that for the past 4 months have we invented anything new in it we haven't what what have we are doing it was already there but we never used it now we decided to use it because we have an ability to adapt and evolve that is a greatness of our um, you know human being as a species that's a greatness it will continue but again i'm bit bit doubtful i'm, I'm bit worried about one thing you know education is it all about this what about emotional skill what about teamwork what about sports and games physical activities because uh, the intellectual activities and academic work is not even 50% other 50% is all these you know how to you know, sports teaches you on uh, two things uh, how to win and how also to accept a defeat understanding a defeat taking a setback is very very important in life to learn because life is not just winning and winning those important aspects of life is missing with uh, whether we follow blended learning or online or whatever it is those we are still waiting we are still waiting because a lot more thing can be done in a team in an outside in a in a in a, in a field a uh, lot of teamwork emotional skill intellectual skills etc has to be learned and if it is not inculcated in them you see we are not doing justice to education and our children will not find that beauty that what i mentioned is life is worth living and i think i'm waiting for this this pandemic to get over a medicine to come in the market and see the students playing laughing no matter even if they're jumping in the classroom doesn't matter that's the life we are looking for thank you for listening to me yes yes i think uh, we are all uh, waiting uh, for this to be over and thanks for highlighting that uh, uh, 
factor uh, humans have a, a tendency to adopt to situations and how we are fighting those situations uh, in the current uh, uh, situation uh, we are in so uh, let me uh, request amit to uh, talk about uh, your uh, expectations of nep and uh, uh, how are both covid and nep are uh, emerging as an opportunity to relook at education itself so ravi ji there are two things uh, i understand that you want me to answer one is uh, how the covid situation has actually transformed the education to answer that uh, uh, you know as prabhakaran ji has mentioned everything was there around us but i think adversity is a great motivator and we started using that uh, adversity to to reinvent things around us uh, or rather readapting our existing resources so i i personally believe that uh, the way the education is going to happen post covid is not going to be same as what it was happening pre covid uh, uh, one beautiful uh, you know outcome of this uh, pandemic can be the way the teachers utilize their time in the classroom so rather than uh, being a sage on the stage i think uh, the whole flip classroom model will become so relevant in the post covid era where the teacher would not focus on filling the students with the knowledge but then exploring the uh, the the inquiry uh, within the students so i think that's one biggest change that i see in the classrooms post covid coming to the second question in terms of uh, you know what i would have wished to see in the nep uh, see the purpose of education as i was talking earlier Uh, today uh, somebody also mentioned that uh, the parents would actually again come back and ask us uh, what is the percentage performance of my child because end of the day the the report card is what the child becomes unfortunately uh, this cannot be solved and i don't see that uh, being addressed in the new education policy is how the higher education institutes will, will assess the children for the competencies that uh, the nep talks about uh, developing in the school children so is it that uh, we are not going to have the je and the neat examinations for the students is it that if i have to apply for a du will i have to score 100% or probably the cut off would still be <laughs> at 100% so i think that that is something which i really see missing in the nep in terms of how the higher education institutes would actually assess the competencies of school children and uh, take them into the higher education if that is not addressed i think the whole vision of new education policy will not be implemented in spirit we will go back to finishing portions we will go back to ensuring that our students score 80 90 100% in the examinations i think that's a big ms in the nep perfect uh, uh, points samit thanks for highlighting that linkage between the school education and higher education with the new uh, ideas has to be created uh, let's say That is a harder uh, part, I suppose. Yeah, and uh, Usha ji, the whole uh, the responsibility of uh, concluding the session is with you. <laughs> yes, and I yes. think yeah, I really enjoyed listening to all the panelists. First of all, congratulations to entire panel. Uh, wonderful points brainstormed, and I think wonderful things came out. There's a question by Mr. Dilip Kumar. Let me take that question first. Is there any sure. difference between private individual owned schools? old public schools and uh, by the board of governor not owned by single owners yes there are a lot of differences there are some schools which are like proprietary owned some are owned by societies and by the trusts and uh, some are owned by the uh, government so there are different kind of boards unaided aided private schools are all different mr dilip kumar ji just try to answer one of the questions so coming back the point i like to conclude by uh, talking about sir ken robinson who just passed away rip rip ken robinson sir he said if we want to make a change in the field of education it cannot be reformed it has to be transformed and i think nep is the answer for it so i am very happy about it that we are going to transform education and we are all educationists who are here to transform education as you said that nep and covid has actually created more opportunities yes there's a lot of parallel opportunities which has been created isn't schools uh, thinking about doing some parallel things to generate funds yes they are thinking rather i will to quote only about me i don't know about other schools we were actually we know our daycares are shut we know our small schools are shut i've got bigger campus as well as the preschools 
so we know that these schools are not going to be operational for some time the children come back so we have started something called tbs learning hubs so tbs learning hubs is where the apartment itself the teachers can i mean the said the heads can you know start it there and the children can come there and learn because social interface social emotional interface for children at least 30 minutes is required as a early childhood expert i'm talking about it's very important we talk about social emotional quotient online it's not going to happen because cognitive skills can happen but not social emotional quotient but then yeah, the opportunities just created it's immense i can see the teachers were teaching online they never knew what is scratch they never knew lot of apps which my teachers are now learning they even learn how to do animation and i think it's actually open a plethora of jobs for all of them and probably they might be doing some side jobs also for all you know so they might be doing that and gaining some money because they all are now knowing that there's so much money online because byju's is also open a lot of opportunities lot of people are saying can you do online teaching when they get the confidence you have to be very careful when you're hiring teachers you better pay them very well because they've got a lot of opportunity coming online so when we are teaching in our schools we are teaching our children in schools the career opportunity the, there is no match to what careers or the uncertainty of the uh, which is going to be there and the 10 years down the line there should be match between what we teach and what they are going to take because right now there's no match we teach something else they take something else so if we are going to teach that kind of a te- that kind of methodology wherein there will be lot of career opportunity for children and prepare them for uncertainties so bring up the adversity quotient in our curriculum because they have to do that have you seen children panicking have you seen adults panicking there's oh my god covid ho gaya pass wale ghar mein so we don't want them to panic we want them to stand up for that so this will happen only when we bring in adversity quotient in as a part of curriculum we not talk about emotional uh, iq eq sq everything is there so now people are all praying to god oh my god let my relative become all right so spiritual quotient has come back right maybe everybody's spirituality is different so i think that these are the thing which has come because of covid which i have realized and the opportunities which is plethora of opportunity which has opened up because of online thing i think that is amazing so putting everything together i can only say that let's keep up the creativity of the children intact let's keep the creativity of the teachers intact this is what even ken robinson sir said are we going to kill the creativity so let us do a blended learning even after covid is over let's do a hybrid model and let's keep that digital literacy going on along with our teaching so that's the way to go and all the best and new normal namaste to everyone sure so uh, i uh, excellent input sosha ji uh, thanks for highlighting the various opportunities which have emerged both for the teachers and both for uh, schools also i have to like look at uh, new wave of growth so i think yeah each ad visual and each organization has to reinvent in these times and uh, of course the nep age uh, giving uh, us an opportunity to uh, re look at uh, school education and uh, uh, do some uh, amendments in it uh, so that the children are ha- happier teachers are happier and the school owners are happier so with this, uh, with this we will conclude the session i uh, thank uh, prabhakaran ji usha ji uh, amit kumar jain uh, meer ahmed ji uh, for uh, being here and uh, uh, having this excellent discussion I really enjoyed a lot Thank you so much. You also enjoyed a lot. Thank you so much all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Ravi. Thank you everybody.